Yeah, that's we did soon. Okay, yeah, right now I'm battling a little bit of a nerve pain problem. So it, interesting exercise that helps. So the doctor said you have to do stretches. You got to stretch, floss the nerve. They don't realize the nerve. Is. So it's, the action is like I'm a little teapot. You know? <laughs> and then you're meant to just move the nerve a little bit to offer some relief. Um, this is probably a self-created problem because I had like, muscle tension. And then uh, last week went to see a Chinese sensei. And then, wow, very vigorous, the muscle and everything else. Then come out, worse. So I went to see the doctor, and the doctor, and the doctor said, uh, if it's muscle pain, that is good, but not nerve pain. If you go and squeeze the nerve like this, it's going to make it worse. So now I probably have to have six weeks of it just got to be there until it recovers. There's not much you can do. So the, see, the good thing is it's unlikely it is coming from uh, you know, uh, bulge, morning. Your bulging disc kind of a thing is most likely a muscle problem that has pulled it. So this is what happens when you lack knowledge and you go and try to self-diagnose things and you could make things worse. So this is a lesson for me to learn as well. It is a reminder of how much the spiritual world is sometimes you know, is the same. When we don't know and then we've got to do it ourselves, and then it can make things worse. Right? So it, this all applies. The pain is a very good teacher. It will teach us lots of lessons, uh, you know, things that we should do, things we shouldn't do. Right? So from time to time, if you see me doing the, my little teapot, you know, the little teapot action, it's just flossing the nerve. It's just when the pain comes and you have to just stretch it like that, it offers some relief, right? Otherwise, I'm on a stronger painkiller. That's, that's what it is. Um, I cannot take too much because it's got other side effects, right? Apart from that, I'm thankful. I have a voice to speak. That's, that's yeah, something to be thankful about, right? Well, we begin with a word of prayer, and, and let's take up this study this morning from Matthew 16. All right? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for grace and mercy in life to cope with challenges. And we thank you that we can look to the Lord Jesus as an example of what it means to walk worthy, to fulfill that call that was given from heaven. Help us to learn as the disciples learn, lessons that will help us develop our life and our faith. We ask that you would bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now let's go to Matthew 16 once again and to look at the whole chapter and then take a look at what the Lord Jesus was seeking to help the disciples to do all this while, right? For all who comes to Him, the Lord will seek to help people find genuine faith. Now, that's the start. All the time. Because a lot of people presume they have faith. Right? The Pharisees presume they have faith because they were very religious. So did the scribes. Because, you know, we read the Scriptures. We search the Scriptures. So the Lord tells them, you search the Scriptures thinking you have eternal life, right? Do you really possess a genuine faith in God? And they knew deep down in their heart they didn't, but too proud to admit, right? John chapter 8, the Lord Jesus confronted them. You really believe me? You would follow me. You would learn from me. And the truth will set you free they would deny they have sins in their life. 
they will deny that they are anything but we are Abraham's children. Now, this was difficult for a lot of people. Now, let's come to the disciples. These were people who were humble and open and candid, right? And so, they counted a privilege to be able to follow the Lord Jesus. They forsook all and followed Christ. Good. But problem is, their faith is very little. Easily shaken, easily troubled, easily deceived. And so Matthew 16, the Lord had to warn them, be, beware of you know, leaven, the false doctrine that are there. So if you have a faith that is not strong, you are in danger of being deceived. It's not very discerning, not, uh, you know, look, problem come, you're troubled, you're shaken. Right? So the Lord Jesus had to address this. Look at chapter 16 and verse 8. Jesus was aware of the disciples' faith. And He tells them, this is the problem. You of little faith. Let me translate this literally. You are little faith people. This is, this is what it is. It is not there and then. This inside you, the kind of faith you possess, is not great faith, is not strong faith. And the Lord Jesus has to help them and is seeking to help them to, to have growth. They must grow. Now, we're going to take a look at how does, how does growth happen? Seriously, have you ever asked yourself, how do I actually grow my faith? Right? Okay, two things. One, there is this thing called natural growth. There are things that grow naturally. Like in my garden, the weeds grow naturally. I don't have to do anything. It just grows. I don't know where, who planted them. They grow and they flourish. And half the time, I have to take them out. Right? Right? We grow physically, naturally, with age. You, you can't, you know, we all just grow. You will grow up, a child, baby, grow. This is all natural growth. With age, you will grow naturally. Faith doesn't grow naturally. Okay? There is a different kind of growth that we need to consider. When we talk about natural, we, we talk about the, the physical, with age, you will grow. So, as I get older, will my faith just grow? Answer, no. Remember, the disciples were full-grown men. And the Lord Jesus tells them, you of little faith. All this while, they have... You know, we're up to chapter 16. This is not first day following Jesus, you know. A year or two may have passed. Have they grown? No. How come? Now, this is what we need to consider here very, very carefully. There is a kind of growth that comes with nurturing. Spiritual growth, we need to be nurtured. It cannot grow without nurturing. This is what discipleship is all about. The Lord Jesus has to teach correct, shape, equip. You cannot grow by yourself without nurturing. Right? Character needs to be nurtured. Skill needs to be nurtured. Nobody becomes a great pianist without proper training, practice, working hard at it. You have to nurture your skill. Right? Yesterday, I was speaking to the young people at Youth Worship. We're studying the book of James about practical faith. We have to teach them practical faith. And James writes in the third chapter how the tongue must be nurtured. The tongue 
is cannot, and the word is cannot be tamed by man. That is a frightening thought. So James wrote very candidly, of all the creatures of the world, man can tame. Yet man cannot tame the tongue. Is that not true? Look at all the problems we see in the world caused by words. They, they call them toxic words. They hurt, they come, come, uncontrolled, unrestrained, unruly evil. If you really want to tame the tongue, you're going to need the nurturing of the Lord. Discipleship. You let it go untamed, uncontrolled. It is like a bushfire. It is worse and worse and worse. This is, I want to bring this up because this is the, the thrust of Matthew 16. Otherwise, we don't understand why, why we are reading what, where Jesus is coming from. He has to help them. This is called nurturing. All right? I nurture my children. Through talking to them, to relating with them, to teaching them, to correcting them. Young, when they are younger, when they are little ones, there was a lot of restraint upon them. These days, less, because right, they, they know, okay, this is going to get my parents very angry with me. This one, okay. This is restraint. And as you grow further, more instruction. Not that they don't make mistakes, but nurturing. Why are we so, as it were, strict on them? Nurturing. This happened. But once that age is over, very hard. Like bonsai, you try to bonsai a plant when it is more mature, very difficult. When it is young, you can shape it. It's the same. Right? Of course, it's going to take an act of God in our life to really, no man can tame the tongue, James says. In other words, only God can. And we're going to need the Lord's help, the Lord's grace. In this case, the Lord Jesus says to them, follow me and I will make you become all that God destined you to be. Right? That is the challenge. So when we talk about growth, please don't confuse natural growth. Right? Sometimes we think, okay, I'm growing. I just need to involve God. Incorrect. Without God, you can't even grow at all. At all. It's not a question of involving God in your growth. Yes, this one, no need. You'll just grow physically with age. Sometimes we think, well, if we go through problems, we will grow naturally. Not true. I've seen problems crush people. Going through problems by itself does not automatically make you better, grow wiser. But going through the challenges... If you know how to seek God, this was my message to my seniors in, on Thursday. And our focus is about seeking God. Isaiah 55, the Lord says to His people, Seek me, seek me while He may still be found. Call upon His name while He is near. Because there is this thing called too late. Don't. Wait until it's too late. And so David wisely, Psalm 63, O oh Lord, you are my God. Early will I seek you. That is wise. Right? So seeking the Lord as you go through challenges. Lord, what am I to learn from this? Can I draw from you strength? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, you discover a strength that is greater than your own. A strength that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Paul could say. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
is the Lord that source of strength? That's how Paul grew the way he did. That's why he could attempt things, do things, learn things where other people were oh, too hard. The Lord became his strength. Now that is the challenge of the disciples. That's what Jesus is seeking to help them to develop this kind of growth. Right? So can a person grow without the Lord? Answer, simple answer, no. Or can I just grow naturally? Yeah, you can grow naturally bad. It's like bushfire, just let it go. If you really want to grow spiritually, if you want to develop godly characteristics, if you want to develop a spirit that reflects the Lord, if you want to develop a faith that is strong, it, this is the Lord Jesus program, discipleship. Right? Now, we're going to see this. So, the Lord has to teach. So, He would reveal to them. Right? And, and the word is revelation because reveal means there is an external, it's coming from outside to show you to reveal to you knowledge. Otherwise, you cannot see it. Obviously. So the Lord will tell them. Now, let's take a look at this. Okay? And so, um, the Lord Jesus asks, Simon Peter, who do, you think, who, who do you think that I am? Simon Peter answered in verse 16, oh, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, that was the first part. Right? This is knowledge of Christ. And the Lord commanded, Bless are you. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but God, your Father. Right? God reveals as we seek Him. Right? Now, that is, uh, this is what is uh, there. That's the first part. And so the Lord Jesus revealed further, I also say, Right? This is teaching you. That's what nurturing is. Showing you, teaching you, revealing to you things otherwise you will not be able to see. And then the Lord Jesus revealed to Peter. Good. Start here, Peter, with Christ. Who am I? Start with knowledge of Jesus. If you don't have knowledge of the Lord Jesus, you don't have faith in who Jesus is, you will never understand what the church is. It's connected. This is your starting point. Who am I, the Lord? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Good. Now, next part, I say to you, right? Upon this rock, I will build my church. Does he know everything yet? No, this is just a starting point. This is the next part, the church. Now, this, we come to a third part. And this part is not easy to understand, actually. Right? Now, let's come, this was last week, where we talk about the authority that would be given. What is your role in the church? Right? And Peter, you have a role to fulfill. I will give to you the keys of heaven. Right? And entrusted to you. Responsibility given to you. That is a sobering thing to be given. Entrusted with the responsibility to fulfill. Now, Peter, this is your role. Now, you come to the next part of it. And the next part isn't easy, is even harder. And it involves the Lord's suffering. Right? So the Lord begins with easy. And then you go deeper. And then you take on a little bit deeper. And then the hardest of all, profound, how do you understand the will of God in suffering? 
Now, that is what the Lord Jesus would now reveal. Now, let, let's take a look at verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his, to His disciples. Right? Look, take a look at verse 21. He began to show them. The word show. Why, why use the word show? What did He show them? It's not like switch on a movie show. The word show is simply to explain things to you. You could use the word to reveal. It's the idea to demonstrate to you. To help you to understand this. That is the teacher. You need somebody to teach you, to show you. Right? That was David's prayer. Lord, show me your way. Teach me. Guide me. Wisely. Because you think you know where to go, how to go. David did and went off. And then he comes back to God, Lord, you show me. Show me your way. He began to show them. Now, this is an important. His disciples, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. And the word is must. Right? Not may, but must. He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things under the hands of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and he must be killed. That is not an easy thing to understand, let alone accept. And he says, and be raised the third day. Right? What would be the Lord Jesus showing them, help them to understand His suffering. And a lot of the time, we don't understand the suffering. We don't even understand the suffering of Christ. I remember many years ago, you know, somebody invited uh, this person. He was a young person. He says, I grew up in church. It was Easter time. And he says, says to me, I never understood why we celebrate Easter. Why are we celebrating the suffering of Jesus? It's abs absurd. Can a person grow up in church and for the life of him don't understand? We assume people understand. Not really. Right? Did the disciples understand? No. Well, because he have not seen the full salvation. Well, today, people know that Jesus must suffer and die, right? They still don't understand. Right? Now, well, let's go back to this part. I, I don't want to presume you understand too. What would the Lord show them? Well, I, I believe with all my heart, the Lord will show them the Scriptures. Isaiah 53 is a very clear prophecy that the Messiah, the Christ, will suffer. Right now, this is one of those key texts, prophetic word in detail, the sufferings of Jesus. All right now, let's take a look at Isaiah 53. Uh, 53. And it begins with, Who has believed? Even for Israel, it was hard to ex understand, let alone believe, that the Messiah needs to suffer. They were expecting victory with no suffering, triumph with no death involved, because God can do it. And yet, in God's salvation plan, that suffering needed to be there. In the language of Jesus must suffer, must be killed. Now, 
Why so? We read. Uh, first part is a description of the Messiah and how he will grow up. In verse 2, he shall grow up before him. In other words, he will grow up before God as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness that we see him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he seems to come from pretty ordinary origin. Very common. True. The Lord Jesus was born in Bethlehem, not Jerusalem, not capital city. He was not placed in a rich family. Very humble family of Joseph and Mary. He grew up in a neighborhood not affluent, Nazareth. His ministry was not in Jerusalem, Galilee. Remember the, what was said about him? What good can come out of Nazareth? So people despise him. People reject him. Now that is all, remember, prophesies. He was called a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Not because he's a sad person, but because of what he has to go through. Did he experience poverty? Yes. Did he experience the challenges of life and death of loved ones? Yes. We all go through this. This is about identification with probably 90% of the world. Because only 1% of the people in this world live in so-called, you know, don't have these problems. Of the rest of the world, we see these problems here. And so God gave a Messiah that would identify with pretty much the whole world. And we read, right? Now, this all talks about, you know, he, he was despised, did not esteem. Now, verse 4, surely he has borne our grief. He has carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God. Right? Afflicted, he was wounded. Now, smitten, chastised, suffered. Remember all those things here? Afflicted, how come? Now, we read in verse 5 he was wounded for our transgression. Not his, he had no sin. He had no transgression. Why would God afflict him? Our transgression. Now, that is. The message here. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. In order to have peace with God, God had to chastise the Lord Jesus for the sake of mankind that they have a chance of restoration. That is now clearly shown the suffering that had to be laid upon His stripes, we are healed. We are like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to His own way. Right? This is the transgression. We often think, what is a transgression? Well, we've not, we didn't murder, we didn't kill anybody, we didn't steal, you know, what is our transgression? You've gone your own way. You've done your own thing. That in itself is a grave sin. And we don't even realize this. Gone astray, turn to your own way, and the Lord had to lay upon him the iniquity of us all. All of us are guilty of this. Right, look at that. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. In other words, he took it. He didn't complain, he didn't, he accepted, he understood. The, the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer. He must be killed. 
and is not easy to take, to accept. Oppress, afflicted, right? And we read on further. Verse 8, he was taken from the prison, from judgment, he and who will declare his generation? Cut off from the land of the living. The transgression of my people, he was stricken. So again and again we read his suffering was not because of his transgression, but the transgression of God's people. They were made his grave for the wicked with the rich at his death. Now, this is just so detailed because even about the grave, right? He was put in the tomb of Joseph Arimathea, who is a rich man. Now, this is how accurate prophecy is because he had done no violence nor their deceit in his mouth the Lord will honour his death. He is not a charge crew because in Rome, there is no burial for those who are crucified. You're left, your, your body is left there for the beast to devour. That's their way of shaming you, but not Jesus' body. He's not a criminal. He has suffered, he will be crucified, he will die, but even in the burial, he's not criminal. Now that is the Lord's way to honour. Verse 10, it pleased the Lord to bruise him, and he has put him to grief. Now what does this mean? Did, did the father take delight in afflicting pain on his son? Absolutely not. No father takes delight in afflicting pain or chastising their children. Now, what was it that the Lord was pleased with? Now, this part, He made His soul an offering for sin. He shall see His seed, shall prolong His day. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in His land. He saw beyond the suffering. He saw the salvation plan of God. That is what he saw. He shall he see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. The Father would see what the Lord Jesus has done. It was not just at Calvary, it was from the moment he was born all the way, his whole life. That is what we're looking at. So we mustn't just think the Lord Jesus, okay, it was there and then He did the final act and then the Father was His whole life. Right? So some people think, okay, I can do whatever I want now. Only at the end, I just turn back to the Lord and I say, ask God, forgive me and cleanse me of all my sin and accept me to heaven. You imagine. God looks at your whole life. What have you done? Remember, there is a too late. Don't seek God like that. The example is Jesus. Right? Look at it. From that moment all the way, God assessed the, His works of His hand. He assessed how He has given Himself as an offering to God, His soul. His knowledge, see, His knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many. By His knowledge, the Lord Jesus taught many, helped many come to salvation in God. By His knowledge. So it's not just the act of crucifixion, but His whole life and what He has done with that life. It's the same for us. What have we done with our life that God has, we say God has given to us? Right? This is honouring the Father. It is not a point of, okay, God, I come to church, I'm honouring you. But what about Monday to Saturday? Right? 
right? That work that He has done, that life that He has lived, the knowledge that He possessed has helped many come to salvation in God. By His knowledge, my righteous servant. What kind of servant? God had to use some very strong words to Israel. Israel, you are a blind servant. You are unfaithful servant. You are wicked servant. And God had to rebuke and chastise them. For Jesus, with joy and pride, God declares, my righteous servant. And he would go as far as bear the iniquity of the people. Now, this we can't do. The rest we can, with knowledge, help people. Right? Live a life for God as an offering. Yes, but there are some things only Jesus can. And this is one of them. Bear the iniquity of the people. Verse 12, therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. This is the, the inheritance that Paul writes about. Why through faith in Christ we have an inheritance? Because God was pleased to divide a portion of this inheritance to Christ. The spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, he was numbered with the transgression, he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgression. God, the Lord made intercession. This is John 17. He prayed for the, his disciples. He prayed for the future disciples. And God was pleased with him. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. These are all the lessons Jesus is seeking to teach His disciples. This is how you grow. This is how you grow. That is discipleship, if you want to understand what discipleship is all about. Did Peter learn it and immediately? Well, not really. Did he respond well immediately? Not really. Now, let's take a look at Matthew 16, the response of Peter to what the Lord Jesus taught concerning suffering, concerning, uh, you know, what he must do as the Son of Man. What was Peter's response? Well, we read here in Matthew 16, in verse 22, Peter took him, the Lord Jesus, aside and began to rebuke him. Imagine rebuking the Lord. He thought, he, in his mind, he thinks Jesus is wrong. In other words, he needed to correct Jesus. And he said to the Lord, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Right? You will not suffer. I will defend you. Well, this is Peter, the brave. This is called speaking foolishly, you see. Did Peter say this? How did he say it? Well, I think he said it out of deep love. Did he love Jesus? Yes. No question about it. He does not want to see his master suffer. Certainly, he does not want to see his master die. Right? It sounds great, Peter. He was a leader there of all the disciples. He said it in front of everybody. It will not happen to you. Right? First, he's going to defend his master. He's not going to let his master get captured. He's not going to let his master certainly suffer and certainly won't let his master die. Very loyal. Uh, listen to what the Lord Jesus has to say to him. Verse 23. And the Lord turned and said to Peter, Peter, firstly, you may not be aware of this. 
but he has to tell him that what he just said is an offence. Right? Look at this. First, the Lord had to rebuke and had to address and he had to tell him that the person behind him suggesting such thoughts is none other than Satan. Now that to me is frightening. Because you love someone, you want to do everything for the person, can Satan suggest such things? Right? Now, let's take a look at this. And get behind me, Satan. Now, the, Jesus is not calling Peter Satan. Okay, you mustn't think. Neither was Peter possessed by Satan. He is saying the person behind you whispering those things is Satan. Now, that is a very subtle influence. And then he turns to Peter himself, you are an offence to me. Uh, these words might come shocking. For reason, he said that you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. That's all Satan needs to do, by the way. Is to suggest to you the things of man are more important than the things of God. Suddenly, he's distracted. See, the things of man is very easy. No suffering. We all know no suffering. How do you want to die? God, let me grow old, old age and then I close my eyes, I open it and I'm in heaven. No suffering, minimal suffering. That's the things of man, right? You certainly don't want to be killed, right? There's a the prayer young Christians make, God, please don't send me to Africa. I might get eaten by lions. The fear of had need to give our life, very scary thought. Send me to a comfortable place to be a missionary. We all think of life's comfort as everything. Everything, as comfortable as possible. As free from suffering as possible. And yet, for the Messiah, his pla God's plan for him included these things. He must. Jesus already explained it to him. And yet, in his mind, he cannot accept, and neither should Jesus accept. This is hindering God's salvation plan. That is an offence. Right? So the Lord had to rebuke the Lord, uh, the, the, you know, Peter very, very strongly on this matter. You are not mindful, Peter, of the things of God are the things of man. And you see, unfortunately, that's how Satan has managed to sway so many. So many people, they think of what is most important? My happiness, my life, myself, is all about me. What about the things of God? I'm sure God wants me to be happy, right? Did you read? Look at, look at Isaiah 53. Look at the contrast. Whoa, what did the Lord Jesus have to go through? And God was very happy with him. That is such a total contrast. Satan, all he needs is to suggest things. He does not need to possess anybody. That's the last thing he needs and wants to do. This is called stealth. If you cannot trace his handiwork, even better. Right? Anybody that is out to scam people, do not go in, I'm a scammer. You don't even know you've been scammed. You think you're still on the right path. You're already off course. Right? How do you check? Where are the things of God in your life? Is it in your heart? Is it in your mind? Not there. 
What is there? The things of man. It is consumed by the things of man. That's all you think about. It worries you. It's, it's something that you constantly pursue. Remember, can it happen to even a disciple like Peter? Remember, Peter was given, you know, blessed are you, Peter. You know, God has revealed these wonderful truths to you. He was commended. He was entrusted re with responsibility. And yet, Satan can influence him. So please do not imagine Satan cannot influence us. Right? All he needs is to push a little thought here, whisper here. He's just going to be behind. He's not going to be in the forefront. Suggest that you begin to realize what Peter said. Nobody realized it. None of the disciples discerned it. Only Jesus. He discerned this and he rebuked him. You see, this is why growth is so necessary. Without the Lord's Word, without the Lord, without His Holy Spirit, we're going to end up just easily deceived. That is a sobering thing. And Peter had to be corrected. Right? Okay, any questions you want to raise up? I, I hope to explain this part of it. Uh, this is very important. The Lord Jesus was not calling Peter Satan. You must you know, banish the thought. Satan was there to influence. Peter was at fault here because he is more mindful of the things of man, even though it's legitimate, his love for Jesus, his concern for Jesus is so strong that he has put the things of God aside. And that is your first step of going off. You are an offense to me. The word offense is the word stumbling block. Peter, you're going to stumble, and you've already stumbled. And you know what? You're going to stumble the rest. He had to correct this. Why was that such a strong word? All the disciples must hear this. This is wrong. The Lord Jesus discerned it, saw through it, dealt with it. Right? Okay, any questions you want to raise up before we uh, take up the next part of it? Right. So please don't, okay, I, I, I'm free from these things. Nobody is. We need to be constantly in touch with the Lord. This is why nurturing is so necessary. Right? You nurture children. You nurture all who desire, disciples who desire to grow and develop this. You cannot remember, grow on your own. You can't. You need that nurturing. Right? So to all those who are baptized, it doesn't end there. The nurturing continues. Right? They keep in touch. They relate. From time to time, they are given an opportunity to share. Not because we need people to share, but because it helps them reflect. Keep in touch with the Lord. Keep in touch with your faith. Challenges are given. Can you... Learn to serve the Lord. Can you learn to give of yourself? Now, they can say no. And you will watch the growth go backwards. Right? This is the same program the Lord Jesus gave to His disciples. Nurturing. Constantly teaching. Watching. Correcting. This is what we all need it's not just listening. Coming and listening to a message is just one part. So I, we're taking the, teaching the young people, don't just be a hearer of God's Word. Yesterday, I shared with them three things. James' approach. 
Growth should be there, but what are the problem, the hindrance of growth that must be addressed? For the young people, they have so many hindrances, unfortunately. One is the way they listen to God's word. And so James addressed, do not be a hearer alone. You must be a doer of God's word, not hearing alone. Two, look at your actions, the way you do things. Works and faith, we're not talking about good works, we're just talking about actions. How you regard people, how you receive people, how you relate with people. It must be, you must be consistent with your faith in words, in works. This is what James was teaching. Right? A lot of the time, we're inconsistent. On the one hand, we bless the Lord. On the other hand, we curse people. And James said, how can that be? How can spring water come from a spring and bitter at the same opening? Cannot. Right? No man can contain the tongue. Why? Because the tongue will reflect what you are really, who you really are inside. If this is a spring water, it will come out spring. If this is a fig tree, it will bear fig. If this is a grapevine, it will bear grape. Fig cannot bear grapes. Grapes cannot bear fig. In other words, what comes out reflects who you are deep down inside, the truth of it all. That's what James was addressing to help people see what are the things that is actually hindering their growth. Right? It's very similar to the Lord Jesus Christ in what He is teaching. Right? Okay, up to, over to you for questions. I, I, up, uh, if you want to ask any questions at all. Anyone? Well, how do they overcome this? Seriously. How do you become, how do you actually combat this? Remember, it will affect you. The evil one will do whatever it takes. If he will want to distract, to deceive. Right? You should read the book called Screw Tape Letters. This is about, it's, it's, um, it's fictional, okay? It's not, not, not an actual account but it highlights certain truths. It's about a junior demon assigned to, they call it patient. Uh, uh, first, this person is a non-believer, and the little, you know, junior demon reports to the uncle, the superior demon. And first, stop the person from becoming a Christian. By all means, stop. Right? We don't realize. It's true. Why is it so hard for a person to come to faith in the Lord? You don't know there are spiritual powers there trying to stop it. Right? So why Paul says, you know, the power of God to salvation is the gospel message. You need the power of God. Now, and then the junior demon failed. <laughs> the person became a Christian. Oh, you see, he's not experienced enough. And then, what do I do? Okay, okay, now, your task now is to stop him from developing his faith. Make him go astray. Take him out of everything possible to just distract him. Okay, well, we got to then send, send all kinds of things. Send a girl. This is called distraction. Send... Uh, you know, all, all these things were sent. Now, he's not so distracted. So the junior demon said, can we send suffering? And then the uncle said, what's wrong with you? You really are inexperienced. The last time we sent suffering, the Christians grew. He's referring to the book of Acts. Make him comfortable. Right? Give him all the comforts in life. Yeah. If he suffer, he will pray. Don't, don't. <laughs> right? No problem. He won't pray. Right? He's just going to be so consumed with his life. Just let him be. And you read that book, you know, of course, you have a good laugh, but you know, yeah, it's quite true. 
That is a whole thing. Of course, at the end, there is a story by C.S. Lewis. You know, he, the guy, the junior demon failed. The person became you know, a Christian that he grew. And wow, there is somebody greater than these things. And it is the Lord himself. He's going to help us. All right? But what is the path to helping us? Now, this is what we are looking at. And the rebuke came. But the Lord did not stop at rebuke. He has to help them overcome this problem. How do you overcome the problem of being mindful about God rather than just the things of man? Now, the Lord made it very clear, very plain to His disciples. Now, He addressed all the disciples because they were all there lest they think Peter is right. Remember, Peter is stumbling the rest with his remark. And Jesus had to correct them all and said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, you want to succeed? You really want to follow me? One, you do what I do. Deny self. Two, you take up the cross. This is suffering. And you follow me. Do these three things and you will succeed. Plain and simple. Right? They need to come back to this. Can you deny self? This is mindful of the things of man. A lot of the time, we cannot deny self. You want to come to Sunday school? Oh, it's too early. Right? I once had a friend I invited to church, and he asked me, what time does your church start? I said, 10.30. Oh, it's too early. On a Sunday, too early. And then in the same breath, he invited me to go and play golf. I said, what time? He said, 5.30. What? What? So 5.30 a.m. is not early to play golf. But 10.30 a.m. is too early to go church. I was trying to see the logic in it. I couldn't. So I said to him, too early. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's the same. Self. Can we deny self? Really? Can you deny self? Whoever desires, and a lot of people desire to follow Jesus, but they fail along the way. After a while, they drop out because they cannot even do the first thing, deny self. Don't talk about suffering. <laughs> Just deny self. Can't even do it. And they say, we're following Jesus. Really? You're denying self? You're taking up the cross? then you're following Jesus. Right? This was why God says, His, I'm well pleased. Delight is there in the Lord Jesus because Jesus was able to deny self. He is teaching the disciples what He is doing. Jesus never taught anything that He has not done. Right? You want to be a teacher one day. This is why James said, let not many be teachers. Right? Not that he's discouraging. First, you be a disciple. Can you deny self? You cannot teach that which you are not doing. Do not teach others. Do not attempt to teach others that which you are not practicing. That's called hypocrisy. You want to be a teacher? Practice what you are teaching first. Right? You want to really develop your faith and grow your faith? Try. You know what? I am accountable, responsible to share this. With. Suddenly, there is a burden and urgency to look at the Lord's Word and to apply it because you know you cannot teach this without first doing it. 
that has been a burden and challenge and weighs upon my heart all these years, why it pushes me to grow. I know I cannot teach this word unless you do it. Right? There's no other way. There's only one path, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no plan B here. There's only one. You want a desire to come after me? You deny self. You take up the cross. Follow me. It's a question of what you, whether we will do it or not. Much depends on it. Right? So disciples, are you willing? Do you want to grow? Remember, it's nurturing. I will have to correct you, the Lord Jesus tells us. He rebuked. He pointed out that which is wrong and sinful. Now, he's going to give them. You want to learn how to overcome? Deny self. And the Lord Jesus would deny self. He would think of his life as an offering to God. What about the cross? Take up the cross. Follow me. That's his pattern. Right? That's a challenge for all of us who really would like to overcome. Otherwise, we will not be able to overcome. Okay? These are vital lessons for all of us to learn, to consider very, very carefully. Right? It's very clear how to succeed. It's a question of whether we will take it up or not. Okay, right. Any questions you want to raise up at all from here? Hmm. Well, may you take heed to these words. And may we stay focused, stay on track in following the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the word the Lord Jesus taught to his disciples. And these words continue to be very real and relevant to all of us today. The distraction, the deception is very real. That comes from the evil one, that comes from the things of man. And we tend to be more mindful of the things of man than the things that belong to you. Help us to be reminded all over again of the things that we need to be mindful of, the things of the kingdom of God. That we ask that you grant us grace and mercy, wash and cleanse us, correct, help us to turn 